The World Economic Forum, the bane of all of our lives, has just announced that 98% of the world's central banks will be moving to CBDCs in the future. And whilst independent media has covered this announcement, the legacy media is notably ignoring this as much as they can. Those of us who have been paying attention are well aware that this has been coming. The signs have been clear. Countries from all over the world, some of whom are even mortal enemies, are all making the exact same announcements. Trials are being made, technology is being tested, think tanks are being consulted, all with the express intention of accelerating the digitalization of currency, of course to further the control of those up above. But why is the WEF the ones to reveal this to us? Why is this unelected, supranational organization that's globalist filled with bureaucrats and oligarchs the one to make this decision? Unfortunately, we all know it's because they are the ones who stand to gain the most from this. Their influence has been growing, their plans slowly being put into place, and CBDCs are without a doubt on their way as the WEF practically dictates policy to the governments which we elected into power. Their specific claims? That by 2030, in just five and a half years' time, we will see 24 separate CBDCs operating around the world and that more will follow quickly. But where does this concern truly come from? Well, for anyone who is new to CBDCs, the principle is very simple government-issued and government-mandated purely digital money. Money with no physical counterpart, money with rules and code built into it that is infinitely traceable, trackable, and controllable. On the surface, our governments are able to explain to us the benefits behind a system like this. Money allocated for a country's defense could be coded so that it can't be spent on a villa that a corrupt general buys. Say, if a family is struggling to provide for their children and the state wants to help them, they could be given extra money that is coded to only be spent on kids' products. And if someone were to try and sell those products to someone else so they could then spend that child benefits on alcohol or cigarettes, for instance, that could be traceable. Getting scammed by someone online could be rectified within a single second because every individual coin would be perfectly traceable and the authorities could see exactly where it ended up and exactly who committed the scam. But in reality, these ideas are only the tip of the iceberg. And whilst CBDCs may start off by only implementing these more reasonable features, governments always move to secure more power and influence over the people. Before long, people will have their CBDCs locked if they say the wrong thing on social media, or if they choose to attend a protest or an event that the government doesn't approve of. If you do something else unsavory, maybe your money is coded so that you can't buy plane tickets to get yourself out of the country and into safety. Maybe your coins only work within a 10-mile radius of where you live, so if you try to move away on foot, you become essentially dead broke the second you're 11 miles away from home. CBDCs combined with mass surveillance and governments which are already abusing people's human rights every day will be used as a tool of oppression to ensure people are literally incapable of moving against the state. To some, this will seem ridiculous, but the United Kingdom has already devolved into a practically lawless world where literally nothing makes sense in the judicial system anymore. In January of this year, a man named Gabriel Abdullah attempted to stab multiple people in London. The locals he targeted fought back, and thankfully no one was hurt or killed, then the police came in and arrested this terrorist. And yet, on June the 12th, we found out that despite being found guilty of his crimes, admitting to them as well, he was not sentenced to even a single day in prison. He was given suspended sentences, meaning he will never go to prison for these charges, even though he pled guilty and admitted to what he did. But don't you worry, because the British government claims they are going to rehabilitate this man by having him attend an all-expenses-paid holiday at a local rehab centre for 30 days, after which he will clearly never do anything like this again. And in the exact same court system in the exact same country, a man called Matthew Woods was sentenced to three months in prison for making rude jokes about Madeleine McCann on Facebook. Now, this doesn't mean it's good or kind to make jokes about a young girl who was kidnapped, but in what just world is making jokes online such a severe offence that someone should spend three months in prison, but attempting to stab multiple people on a spree leads to not even a single day in prison. In the United States, diversity and equality policies are active and working all over the country, and they specifically discriminate based on race and sexuality, something which ought to be illegal and technically is illegal, but instead 
somehow it's commonplace all over the place. The truth is the law doesn't have any real meaning anymore. People are prosecuted and sentenced based purely on how aligned they are with the government in power. And the courts are already being used as tools to enact this tyranny in our countries so no one in their right mind would ever think CBDCs wouldn't be used in the exact same way. The end game here is clear to see. Social credit scores, a total lack of privacy, and absolute government authority held by the state over everything you do or say. Some places are fighting back. Florida has come out as a steadfast opponent of CBDCs, and thankfully, with the way their population votes, I do hope and it does look like they can continue along that path. But do you really think that holdouts like these will not just be ignored by the globalists' intent on control? Civil strife, perhaps even international conflict, could erupt to bring these holdouts into alignment as well. The best chance we have at this point is, ironically enough, decentralized finance, using similar technology as CBDCs to put them out of business. The key difference, of course, being that control will not be held by the state, but collectively by the people who use these decentralized finance systems, and whilst code will be embedded into CBDCs to make them actively malicious, DeFi has the opportunity to use code for the complete opposite purpose. And that brings me on to DeFi Technologies, a company that has held my attention tightly for some time now. They are essentially a holding company, investing or acquiring into new companies and technologies, bringing traditional financial market access to decentralized finance. Over the last two months, they have generated $83 million in revenue through one of their business lines called DeFi Alpha. By the end of Q1, DeFi Technologies had booked roughly $10 million in revenue, and so far in Q2, they've done a reported $83 million. So their growth has been meteoric, and this is for a profitable company. One of their other companies is called Valor Asset Management, and this company's strategy is to create ETPs for non-US markets to hold crypto assets. Why? To allow ordinary people to gain exposure to the world of cryptocurrency and decentralized finance through their bank or brokerage account. We recently saw the US Bitcoin ETF approved and a similar ETF approved in Australia and Hong Kong as every day, ordinary investors are more and more looking for exposure to the crypto market where growth can be monumental and investments protected. And DeFi Technologies has poised to capitalize off this move through Valor Asset Management. And it's no wonder more and more people are moving towards this world of decentralized finance as they see firsthand the direction of authoritarianism our governments are all moving towards every single day. But honestly, I thought one of the best ways to show you just how promising DeFi Technologies is, is by showing you a couple of clips from their most recent earnings call. And, you know, everyone um, really, really needs to take a minute to think through what Ollie said, in my opinion. 99% um, of the world's companies trade at 20 times profits. We are trading at three times profits. Um, if you're not getting reasonable valuation from the market on your stock, of course you look at ways to to um, to improve that. And and if you're trading at three times, like I mentioned, someone could pay a three hundred percent premium to us, and it would be a take under relevant to relative to any other stock trading in the U.S. Therein lies the opportunity from a from an ownership perspective and why you should be buying the stock, but it's it, it creates a lot of fear in our in our heads. At least it doesn't mine because I like I, I'm not we all like I've said this repeatedly between you know Ali Johan friends family me friends family and and you know very very closely related parties we control probably a hundred hundred and twenty million shares. Um, we're not we're not looking for three dollars on this stock or four dollars, especially in an environment that we're looking at now. We're looking at you know eight to ten, which you know sounds far fetched, but but you know five, six, seven is is where we should be trading just on a reasonable comp basis. Um, and that's not me making things up. Just go look at what all of the other crypto companies are trading for, um, and. and I, I'm not sure any of them are profitable. They're trading on on revenue multiples. Um, we well, actually, I, I, would, I would, I would, I would, I would also kind of interject and say, kind of the only, the only other comps you have are are mining um, companies yeah. that I'm you know fairly familiar with, and um, you know the the great the great thing about our business model is we have fixed costs, so we have no um, asset depreciation. Um, of, you know, machines that need to be constantly upgraded and, you know, 
um, dilutive financings to continually buy uh, new equipment that that doesn't fit it within our purview. So um, so yeah, historically, if you know, uh, I think when when the market gets frothy and um, you know people have used Bitcoin miners as proxies for um, trading equities, we're we're going to see kind of a new a new world where people start understanding our business model. And and give us you know the valuation multiple that that is deserving of a, co a company such as ours. Yeah, so it look huge upside for shareholders, everyone, and and it's it's our job, Ollie's and mine, and and the rest of the team to to get this to a reasonable valuation, um, and and obviously an uplist as quickly as possible will be part of that. Whether I mean, obviously the U.S. would be our primary objective, but we're looking at multiple opportunities and uh, options just because um you know clearly for whatever reason in canada and, and the way we currently trade it we're, we're just not being given um comparable reasonable value to as ollie mentioned the miners or even the galaxies of the world profit i think everybody needs to look at the company as a whole um so so we basically did 10 million us in revenue um in q1 um, Q2, the math is really easy, and I'm using U.S. numbers here, but our, our AUM is basically 50% higher in Q2. Um, so multiply 10 million U.S. In, in Q1, which is, you know, basically break even for the year just in Q1. So you have 15 million um, U.S. call it in profits for Q2, and you have 40 million uh, in profits off of the trade. So we're already at a 55 million uh, profit run rate in the first six months, 55 million should be trading at 20 times uh, profits because we're not even talking revenues. We're talking profits. That's a billion dollar um, AUM company. And if you look at our US market, um, that's a four bagger from our current share price. So there is a massive valuation disconnect here, um, which we're obviously going to be working on uh, aggressively to change. Um, there are broker dealers all over in Canada and the U.S. that are reaching out to us now that they're seeing what this company is doing. Um, uh, and, you know, this is the irony, everyone. Currently, DeFi Technologies is trading at about $1.73 per share, but analysts have a price target of $3, so 70% higher than they're currently trading at. Anthony Pompliano, one of the most recognized authorities in blockchain and decentralized finance in general, said that DeFi Technologies is the number one stock pick he would have pitched at a recent conference if he'd been asked to. In particular, he is incredibly bullish on Valor Asset Management, one of the companies within the DeFi Technologies holding company. And why? Well, because they're creating ETPs in non-US markets for cryptocurrency assets at a time where we're seeing Bitcoin ETFs approved left, right, and center all over the world. DeFi Technology currently has a market cap of just under 500 million US dollars for a business that has generated almost 100 million dollars so far this year, making it seriously undervalued in my opinion. But to tip the scales even further, they've recently announced a stock buyback program, which isn't surprising as they're currently sitting on more than 50 million dollars in cash and they're actually profitable. I'm sure you can understand why this company is so interesting to me. So go over and take a look at them for yourself. This seems to be a great opportunity. They trade over the counter and their ticker symbol in the US is DEFTF. And I'll put a link to some of their materials down below in the description as well.